Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 29 of the Movement as Medicine podcast, and I'm your host, Kevin Carr. Believe it or not, I didn't die. I am here despite my six-month hiatus. Um, I am back to recording the podcast. I'm without my normal co-host, Brendan Rick, but he will be back. Um, he's not here for good reason, and we took a break for six months for a good reason. Um, I had a child, as many of you know, and I wanted to dedicate a little bit more time to trying to be with my family, as well as dedicate more time to some things in my business. Um, Brendan, as some of you may know, him and his wonderful wife, Jenny, are due to have a baby this week. Um, so he has a good reason uh, for being absent, but he will be back at some point. Um, you know, we decided kind of needed a little bit of a hiatus, lots of things going on, both personally, as I mentioned, but also professionally. Um, I know uh, some of you may know this, but back in November of 2022, myself, Stephen Bigelow, Dan McGinley, and Vinny Toludo bought into the equity of Mike Boyle Strength Conditioning. All of us have been there for a long time um, as coaches, managers, um, working in the daily operations, but kind of a big shift for us in taking over ownership. You may think, hey, you've been there for a long time. You're already kind of managing and coaching. But truthfully, there's a lot that goes on that you know we've had to take on as coaches and leaders and, and daily operators within that business. And I think kind of coming into the new year, I know for me personally, I, I wanted to try to dedicate more time to that, um, kind of getting my feet under me in you know, making sure I was doing all the things I needed to do um, to help contribute to make sure that business runs successfully. Um, and so that's been a great learning experience. It's been challenging. Um, it's been fun. Um, I've learned a lot. Um, and we've all kind of taken on our roles within that business and try to figure out, you know, where do we fit? And that's going to be a growing, changing experience as we go. Um, but it's been a lot of fun. Um, and, you know, right now we're kind of in the swing of things, um, kind of coming towards the end of our summer. Some of you might know at MBSC, the summer is our craziest time of the year. Um, you know, from the time the lights turn on at 5 a.m. to the time the lights shut off around 8 p.m., it is slammed um, with clients about every 15 minutes. And happy to say summer 2023 has been our busiest summer yet. You know, we have more athletes than we've ever had. We have more adult uh, uh, group clients than we've ever had. We have more personal training clients than we've ever had. And so things are going really, really well. Um, we also opened up another satellite facility at the Dexter Southfield School, private school in Brookline, Massachusetts, where we have our coaches there running our program in their facilities, servicing their athletes, as well as athletes from the community around there as well. And so that's been a really fun project to take on. And so just lots to focus on where I kind of had to put the podcast on the back burner for a little bit. But happy to say that we are back and I'm going to keep pumping these out weekly going forward. I have a little bit more time in my schedule, a little bit more energy to dedicate towards this. And this is something I really like to do. And frankly, I've had a lot of people asking me where the podcast is. Is the podcast over? And, and I knew I was going to come back, but I just need to take a little bit of time. And we have a lot of good things coming up. I have a lot of great uh, people and guests lined up that I'm going to have on here, both here in the studio at my house, as well as you know virtually that are going to be coming and joining us. So um, look forward to having a lot of great interviews. Like I said, Brendan will return. He'll be a father of two the next time we hear from him, but he will be back um, at some point. So it's just been very busy. I mean, I hope everybody kind of listening and uh, has had a great summer. I appreciate all of those who have been reaching out, asking for us to bring the podcast back and your wishes are granted. So uh, I also appreciate you giving me the time uh, to do the things I need to do, both be a father. I have a 14-month-old daughter now. She walks. So that's been kind of a crazy um, experience to see happen. Um, and so, you know, you know, it's been it's been a lot of fun. And I'm happy to be back doing this. I'm energized to come back and do this now. Um, and, you know, I've had a lot going on. CFSC has also been very busy. For those of you keeping track of our Certified Functional Strength Coach certifications, We've been doing them all over the U.S. We've been doing them all over the world. I had a really busy, you know, May and June and even into July where I was internationally traveling a lot. Um, I, I taught um, in Lebanon for the first time, CFSC level one and two, went straight over to Slovakia, taught CFSC level one and two. I was home for a couple of weeks. It's my daughter's first birthday, coached in the gym, was busy there. And then I hit the road again, or I should say I hit the air again. Um, I taught CFSC Level 2 in Naples, Italy, and shot up to Milan with my friends at FitFarm, Tommaso, 
and Luca, as well as Matt Ibrahim. And we did an awesome two day um, educational course uh, where we kind of teamed up and it wasn't CFSC. We kind of taught our own curriculum. It was a lot of fun. And then shot over to Belgrade and taught CFSC level one and two with my friend Milan and Demir. Uh, looking forward to being back to all those places. Really great opportunity to travel. So just a lot of education and travels on the road. It would have been really difficult to try to record a uh, podcast with that amount of flying. It was just a little bit nuts. Um, and then also perform better. I um, mean, it's perform better summit season. Um, taught I taught in Orlando and Chicago. Um, and I'm going to be taking our whole team down to Providence uh, at the end of this month, August 25th through 10, 27th. Um, and that's always a great experience. I can never, you know, overstate how valuable the Perform Better Summit experience is. For those of you listening, I'm sure many of you have been there. Um, but if you haven't, I'm going to tell you, there's no better value um, for the amount of education you get over the course of three days than attending a Perform Better Summit. I think it's like 300 something bucks and you get three days with four different presenters every single hour. Um, I don't know how many total presentations that is. I can't do the math that quick, but there's a lot. Um, and these are the best of the best. These are some of the best coaches in the world, some of the best educators and teachers in the more, world, more importantly, I think, um, because the people that they bring in to speak at Perform Better not only are great coaches, but they're great teachers and presenters. They're, people take a lot of time to put together their presentation, to think about how they teach, how they speak, and they really care but from providing a great educational experience for you. And what I would say is that, you know, for me, I actually did an interview with Perform Better earlier today, um, kind of talking about what Perform Better has meant to me. Um, and it's funny kind of thinking about it. I really grew up in this industry going to Perform Better Summits. I could, you know, for those of you who know, I started at MBSC when I was like 19 or 20 years old. And at the end of every summer, when we had the Providence Summit, you know, we would bring MBSC, we'd bring the whole team down. Uh, we'd get hotel rooms, we'd stay down in Providence for three days, we'd go to all the lectures from 8 a.m. till the end of the day. Um, and for us, it was like our company field trip. Um, but we were all excited to hear some of the best people speak. Obviously, Mike would speak, Greg Cook would speak, um, Greg Rose would speak, Lee Burton. Um, Todd Dirk and Martin Rooney, all these people who we were so excited to learn from, they're so energized to learn from, and a lot of these people are still speaking. Um, and there's a, a bunch of amazing new presenters as well um, that are there. And for the 300 something dollars that you pay, you can't, the amount of value they give you over the course of that three days is unbelievable. And so you really won't get a better educational experience for the dollar. I don't think there's a better entry level education for someone as a trainer who wants to get the most out of one weekend. Um, I don't think a lot of people have a lot of time or money to be traveling frequently to certifications or seminars, but if you want to get the most out of one weekend a year, I think that's probably your best bet. Um, and even beyond the education that you get, it, the networking um, and social piece of Perform Better might be even more valuable. I would say I could think of the majority of people that I have relationships with in this industry both personally and professionally, are a result of going to perform better and attending the summits and connecting with people there. Um, whether it means, hey, just saying hello to someone in the hallway or connecting with someone in between lectures, going and grabbing lunch or breakfast with someone. I always try to make a point to you know grab lunch with someone who I haven't seen in a while or get breakfast with someone in the morning of. Um, or my favorite part of every summit is the social on Friday night where there's free beer. Uh, can't overvalue free beer, but a little social lubrication is good. Um, and the amount of people I've met and connected with at the summits is is priceless. Um, I can think of a bunch of people who we have professional relationships with now, partnerships, things of like that, or people who I met over a beer at the summits, or you know, met at dinner following the summits. So I was you know talking to our staff today, and you know, we're going to take them down there in a few weeks, and telling them you know if you're going to go make the most out of your weekend. Go there from the beginning on Friday to the end on Sunday. Go out of your way to try to say hello to people, to try to meet new people, connect with new people, and go out to dinner. Go out for beers. That's where a lot of those relationships are built at those types of summits, um, in addition to, obviously, the amazing educational experience. And I can think back fondly of many weekends that I had there with Brendan, with Ana Taco, and we were all living together in uh, Medford, working at MBSC, you know, thinking back um, 
of us, you know, sharing notes from going to our lectures and, and still talking about, you know, the experiences that we had, when we were down there. So um, if you're listening to this um, and you're going to be in Providence, take the time, come say hello to myself, come say hello to our staff. I know um, it'll be a great experience. I'm looking forward to being there, not as a presenter in Providence, unfortunately, if you were looking forward to see me, but just being a uh, person in the crowd. I was gonna, I'm excited to just sit and learn and to see people and to be down there. So I can't overstate the value um, of attending Perform Better. I, I hope to see some of you who are listening now to, I hope to hear, see some of you there. Um, and I, like I said, I spoke in both Orlando and Chicago this year, which was a great experience. And my presentation this year was a little bit different. I kind of switched gears in the past. I always kind of talked about, you know, training, you know, the nuts and bolts, X's and O's of training. But um, this year I kind of switched gears and I gave this presentation, our spring seminar in April as well to a presentation called Get Moving, How to Get New Clients Started and Make Them Stay. And what I did is I switched gears to talking about customer service and business, kind of a big change from talking about programming and progressions and regressions with coaching. Um, but a lot of that has, you know, probably been fueled by me switching gears into ownership of the training facility. And although, you know, I've been an owner at Movement as Medicine and I'm an owner of CFSC for some time now, even though I've worked as a personal trainer and a manager and a strength conditioning coach for some time now, you don't start to value things necessarily like customer service and business until you become an owner and probably until you mature more as an owner. Um, you know, they always say like the teach when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. I'm probably ready to start to um, learn and develop and have more of a passion and dedication towards our business development and our customer service experience. Because we've, myself and Steve and Dan, if any, have kind of moved into that ownership role. And something that I've been very passionate about um, over the last year is diving more into customer service. And so I wanted to put together a presentation to kind of speak on that and how we do things at MBSC, um, both successes we've had, really the practical nuts and bolts of what we do every day, and even some of the failures and missteps that we've had. And so what I did is I put together a presentation that looked at Mike Boyle's strength and conditioning through the eyes of the book, Never Lose a Customer Again by Joey Coleman. You've probably heard me talk about that book on here multiple times. This will not be the last time. I'm certain it's not the first time. Um, but if you haven't read that book, pause the podcast now, go to Amazon, order the book. Okay, go to that now. Uh, I can't overstate how valuable this book has been for me um, and for our business and how it will continue to be valuable for our business. Um, whether you are a business owner with a bunch of employees, whether you are a private contractor working in a gym, just training in your business really of one, um, or you're a personal trainer and you're an employee um, at a business, you'll take away lessons from this book that will make you better at your job and make you more successful at what you do. Um, Joey Coleman does a great job looking at all the aspects of the customer service experience from the initial assessment of the potential client learning about your business all the way through them being a lifelong customer. And he uses real life examples of real life businesses where they've been successful and where they failed um, and gives you immediate takeaways to better service the client. And so what I did in my presentation um, that I kind of want to take some time in the podcast today to talk about is look at all of the phases of a customer service experience, that's what I did in my presentation. And, you know, look at MBSC and say, this is what we do in this phase of the business and really talk about really how we do it. Real practical examples. I think sometimes when people talk about customer service, they say, you know, do a great job, be friendly and all that stuff is important, but they don't really give, you know, real practical examples. So in my presentation, I, I really tried to do that because um, in that process of going through the book and looking at our business, it helped me kind of take the lid off our business and look at where we're maybe making mistakes and where we could improve. Um, and also shine on things I think that we do well. And I think people really enjoyed that. Um, really kind of looking at MBSE, us taking the off and saying what we do from a service experience. I think it's something we do pretty well in a lot of aspects. Um, and I really do think it's a great customer service. It's a difference maker in getting people to buy into fitness. You know, early in your career, when you get into training, 
all you really care about is the X's and O's, right? You care about coaching deadlifts, you care about coaching pushups, bench pressing, programming, and progressions and regressions, and all the coaching cues. And that stuff's really important. I have a whole business in CFSC that's centered around teaching those things, right? Um, but for us, once you start to mature in the business, you start to realize, you know, what really gets people to stick with training and to dedicate themselves to a training experience and to love fitness is the great customer service experience that they get in the business or the great relationships that develop with the coaches who work in the business. Um, you know, I think if you look at the health and problems that we have in America, the fact is in 2020, less than 25% of the population age 18 and over in America met the minimum physical activity guidelines outlined by uh, the World Health Organization or uh, the, the U.S. Um, health organization regarding strength training and aerobic exercise, uh, meaning less than 25% of people, so over 75% of people, a little more staggering, didn't reach the minimal guidelines. 46.3% um, didn't meet either guideline, meaning they didn't meet, re, meet the aerobic guidelines, nor do they meet the strength training guidelines. Less than 25% met both. Um, and so no matter how you cut it, we're not doing a great job getting people to exercise in this country. Um, and I don't think great programming alone can save us. You can have the best program in the world, but if people don't like coming to work with you, if they don't like the experience they have in your business, they're not going to pay you that high dollar price that it requires to get group training, to get personal training, to continue to exercise. Um, some more staggering stats, if you want to hear them, is um, roughly only 25% of Americans even have a gym membership. And of those 25%, 6.3% will never even use it, right? And so we have a lot of people who sign up to go to the gym and just never even capitalize on that. That's kind of that planet fitness model, right? They hope you sign up and just don't show up um, so they can keep billing you. Um, and 50% of those people who have a gym membership will quit within six months. And so we're not getting people to exercise and we're not retaining clients in the gym to continue to exercise. Um, and so we're not doing a great job. And, you know, one thing that's positive that we know from the research is that, you know, personalized coaching, personal training, like what we do, and whether it's group training or one-on-one -on -one training, can significantly change people's attitude and adherence towards exercise. There's plenty of research to support that idea. Um, and so if we can get people to start training and enjoy their experience within your facility, they're very likely to continue to exercise. They're going to have a mindset change in how they value exercising in the first place. And so when you start to look at those stats, you realize, you know, well, one, we're not doing a great job, but two, we can probably use customer service to better, um, you know, motivate people to continue to come in. One thing I always say is that, you know, the average consumer, the average client, they don't know the difference between good training and bad training. If they look in the window of your gym, many people can't really look and say, hey, that sucks. That coaching sucks. That programming sucks. They don't know the difference. But they can walk into your facility and interact with your staff in one day and probably realize the difference between a great customer service experience and a bad customer service experience. And that's why some gyms or some coaches who you might look at from afar and say, I don't think they do a great job, can be very successful. And they can have a gym packed with clients and they can be making a lot of money in their training facility because they probably treat their clients really well. They might not be great technical coaches, but the people that go there probably love them. And there's something to be learned there. You might think, hey, I'm the best technical coach in the world. But then you look around your training facility and you're like, why isn't anybody here? Maybe it's because you're not prioritizing the customer service experience. I know early in my training career, all I cared about was coaching X's and O's. Um, and I had to learn communication skills. I had to learn customer service skills. And luckily, I was in an environment at MBSC where that was really highly valued. Um, and we really valued people with great emotional intelligence, great communication skills, people who were friendly and provided great service. And that's why MBSC has been so successful. I know people look at Mike Boyle's and conditioning and think about Mike and think about his technical contributions to training, how we look at programming, how we look at exercise selection. But I think in reality, the biggest piece that makes us successful is our customer service experience. If you go talk to our, any of our adult clients, especially who come, they, they don't know anything about probably Mike's contributions and where he fits in the world of strength conditioning. Um, and, you know, 
from a functional training standpoint, but they know they love our coaches. They love how they're treated and how they feel when they're in our facility. And that is what has made us successful as a brick and mortar business. And that could be true even if you don't own a brick and mortar business. If you're an online coach, if you run education programs, whatever it might be, customer service is what sticks out because people will continue to invest their money and spend time with you. And that's really valuable from a fitness standpoint because that means adherence. That means they're going to continue to show up. You know, they always say the best training split is, you know, uh, two by 52, right? Two times a week, 52 times a year. That's probably how much the average personal training client or the average group client comes. Um, but if they like coming, a great byproduct of them liking to spend time with you as a person is that they probably get healthier and get more fit. And so one thing I kind of realized in looking at all this customer service uh, education and thinking about our business is that if you want to help as many people as possible, you want to help as many people get as fit as possible, which I think many of you listening probably do, then you have to care about the entire customer service experience. You can't just care about technical coaching and the X's and O's and programming. And although that stuff is important, you have to care about how the client sees your business when they first hear about it. You have to care about how they feel when they first pick up the phone and talk to you or when they first walk into your training facility. You want them to feel like they are a part of a community instantly. And you want them to have a smooth transition in learning about how you do things and how they feel comfortable in it. Um, because in that long term, you're going to build a long term relationship with them where they keep investing and keep participating in that training facility. I mean, what's going to happen is they're going to start to generate more and more organic referrals for you. And so that's what we really, really want to think about is how can we um, create a great customer service experience so then we can give them that great coaching, right? That would say, what's the, the old quote? I think it's from John Maxwell. Um, People don't care how much they know, you know, till they know how much you care. And that is really customer service. We provide them a great um, environment to grow in and then we provide them that great training. I don't think you can be successful with one, with just with one or the other. I think you probably need to have both long term. Um, something kind of staff that I touch on in that presentation is something I actually originally heard on the Business for Unicorns podcast, another podcast I would highly recommend to Michael Keeler, uh, Mark Fisher, Pete Dupuy uh, from Business for Unicorns frequently are on there. They interview a bunch of gym owners around the country who are really successful, a really good nuts and bolts Um, talking about real numbers, talking about customer service, things like that. I don't remember who was on there. So if someone listens to this, um, you can let me know. But I heard him interviewing someone on there. Again, I can't, sorry, I can't remember the name. And they referenced this survey that was out of uh, Stephen Therrett's Fitness Management book, really good book. It's like a textbook if you want to read it, called Fitness Management. And it was a survey that was called Level of Fitness Consciousness Among Americans as a Predictor of Joining and Staying with Exercise. So what they did, it's so a huge survey uh, where they asked a bunch of them, you know, a bunch of Americans, you know, what they thought about exercise, how much they valued exercise, how likely they were going to participate in an exercise program um, to get a feel for, you know, you know, again, predictor of joining and staying with exercise long term. And they put people in really four different categories. OK, and the four different categories were these. Number one, non-believers, two percent of people um, of Americans over the age of 18 were considered non-believers, meaning they don't care about exercise. They don't believe in exercise. They never intend to exercise. They don't ever intend to participate. Um, Those are people that you can, you don't even have to worry about marketing to. (laughs) Those people will never come. Um, And that's okay. You're not going to help everybody. Take those 2%, put them off the table. You're very likely never going to change their mindset. Um, 16% were indifferent, meaning, Hey, I don't hate exercise. I don't love exercise. I don't think I'll exercise, but maybe I, 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 I don't really care. Um, one way or another, that's 16%. About 17% were hardcore participants, meaning they were already hardcore dedicated towards training. Like they were already a member of a gym. They train themselves. They exercise all the time regularly. Your likelihood of converting that person to you is pretty low. Maybe eventually, maybe they move, maybe they have a change of heart, maybe they get injured, they come and see you. But what's more important is that fourth category, right? So again, 16% indifferent, 17% were hardcore participants, 2% were non-believers. So that leaves in that fourth uh, fourth category, 65% what you call uninitiated believers. So uninitiated believers were people who said, hey, I value exercise, I know it's good for me, I want to participate, 
but I'm currently not dedicated towards any single program. I know I need to do more, you know, exercise on and off. These are the people that we want to target to get into the gym. These are people we want to market to to get into the door. And I like to highlight that study because, you know, 65% of um, Americans aged 18 or over is 167 million people. Um, again, there's a lot of opportunity to get people into your training facility, to get people into your gym to exercise. I think often when we talk about sales and marketing, we talk about business, everyone feels like that gym down the street is their competition. That's the why you guys aren't doing well. That's why, you know, we don't have all the clients that we need or, Hey, this person goes to that gym. Why couldn't we get them? There's 167 million potential people out there that could train with you. Now, they're not all in you know the greater Boston area where we are, but there's a lot of them um, who could potentially be your clients. And to be successful, whether you're an online coach or to be a brick and mortar facility, you don't need 167 million people. You don't need a million people. You don't need 100,000 people. You don't need 20,000 people. You need a few hundred people, maybe, in a brick and mortar. You need less than that, maybe, if you're online because you have less overhead. You have less people to pay. Um, you don't have to pay rent, mortgage, whatever it's going to be, um, on your building. Um, but the point is there's clients out there and I like the one to start after I talked about, you know, the stats about people not exercising. I want to touch on that just to shine a light that we have a lot of work to do. And there's a lot of people who want to exercise and are not exercising or not meeting the minimal guidelines. And so, um, I, when I read that stat and I heard the guy say that on the podcast and I'll link to the podcast so I can find the guy's correct name. Cause I, I feel bad. I don't know it. Um, it really, it gave me a lot of hope and optimism as a business owner that, you know, we can have a huge impact. And I think if you go out there and you market towards who you think your target audience is, who you think you can best service, whether that's, Hey, you know, I train the, you know, 50 year old person who wants to get their body back and wants to get out of pain or, Hey, I train, you know, the high school or collegiate athlete who wants to take their business, take their fitness to the next level, or, Hey, I'm a weight loss coach. Specifically, I help people lose fat or whatever it might be. You're a powerlifting coach, find your niche, your avatar, and you market hard and provide great customer service towards that population. You're going to be fine. There's not a shortage of clients out, out there for you to do well. I think sometimes we use it as an excuse that we think the gym down the street is taking our clients or the people across town are taking our clients. That's not the case. Um, I think we just need to do a better job of getting the word out and getting people in the door to come and work with us. And so um, that was one of the stats and one of the highlights of my presentation I wanted to talk about. Um, and in doing that, we talk, you know, it's a lot of talk about sales and marketing and you know, um, you know, especially now there's a lot of talk about online ad sales and marketing is the most popular thing, you know, Instagram ads, things like that. And there can be a lot of value in that. Um, but there was another great study called intrinsic motivation and exercise adherence. And it was journal of sports psychology. Um, and what they found in that they looked at motivators to get people to start exercising. And then they looked at motivators to get people to continue exercising. And we know with gym, with gyms or any training experience, whether it's online or a brick and mortar, that it's, it's about two things. It's about sales and marketing, getting people in the door, new leads, but then also about retention, getting people to stay in the training facility long term, right? Because if you're pouring a lot of water into an empty bucket, you're going to need to pour a lot of water. But if you're pouring a lot of water into a, into a bucket that doesn't have a hole in the bottom, okay, Eventually, that bucket's going to fill up. You're going to be doing just fine. That water that's overflowing, it's called your profit, right? So um, those two things are both equally important. We need to get new people in. We need to continually get leads because you're not going to retain 100% of your clients, no matter how good of a job you do. But if you're not retaining clients, you always have to chase leads, and that's not very valuable either. And so in this study, what they looked at is extrinsic and intrinsic motivators. And what they found is that people often start exercising because of extrinsic motivators, things outside of themselves, um, their aesthetics. Hey, I, I want to start exercising because I want to lose 10 pounds. Um, or I want to start exercising because I have to improve my hockey performance. Or I have to improve my baseball performance. You know, that high school kid or middle school kid might sign up to train with you because they want to get better at their sport. Um, or maybe that adult client signs up because their doctor said they have to lower their blood pressure or that they should probably lose a little bit of body fat to be healthier. Those are extrinsic motivators. You know, something the doctor told them, their performance, how they look. Those are all reasons extrinsically why people sign up. Generally, people sign up because of extrinsic motivators, right? 
but people will continue to exercise because of intrinsic motivators, their enjoyment, their social connection with you, their, how they feel in the community aspect within your gym. Most people don't go to sign up at a gym because just because they heard the coaches there are fun or, or friendly. Maybe that they're, they get a referral from a client coach, uh, from a friend that goes there and says, hey, my coach is really nice. But they probably also said they help them feel better or help them lose weight, whatever it might be. Likewise, we also know a lot of people who get great results somewhere but don't continue to train there. Maybe because they don't feel a connection with their coach or they haven't enjoyed their experience even though they got better. And so both of these things are important. And so something I highlight in my presentation is that when we're doing sales and marketing and looking for leads, we probably should try to touch on extrinsic motivators. Hey, if you come and train with us, we'll help you lose that extra 10 pounds you've been working on. Or hey, if you come and train with us, we're going to help you make sure your shoulder and your back feel better. If you're someone who's been injured in the gym before, what we do is we help you train better without getting hurt, right? That's a great message um, if that's your population. Hey, if you come and train with us, we're going to help you improve your sprinting, improve your change of direction skills. We're going to help you get stronger, faster, and be healthier on the field of play. Those are extrinsic motivators. We want to use that type of messaging to try to get people to be excited about coming to see you. Every time someone sees a message about your business, an ad, they're always assessing if you can solve their problem. That's straight out of Never Lose a Customer Again. Every time someone sees your business, whether they consciously think it or not, they think, can this business solve my problem? And we want to touch on those extrinsic motivators and tell them what we can do. Because that might be the motivator for them to send that email, to do that cold call, or even to just walk into your business that day to learn more. We have to put a little spark on them to do that. And extrinsic motivators, the science tends to show, are a really valuable way to do that. But then on the other side of things, we want to make sure we're retaining people. And like I said, good coaching and great technical skills are not necessarily enough. The science shows that intrinsic motivators are what get people to continue exercising and participating in exercise. And most people, if they're participating in exercise, they're paying someone to help them do it, whether it's them just going to a gym or paying for coaching. Um, and so if we care about retention and getting people to continue to come, we need to double down on customer service experience, making sure from the day that they step into their, your business that they're getting comfortable with your way of doing things, they feel comfortable, they feel supported by your staff, and that you're holding their hand, especially in that critical period over like that first 30 to 90 days. I think in Never Lose a Customer, again, he says first 100 days for most businesses is where it's like a make or break period. I think in gyms, it's like the first 30 days because in, re in reality, they're probably going to have maybe eight intense experiences over that first 30 days. The average client, again, comes two days a week in a training environment, whether it's personal training or group training. Those, they're going to be able to decide after eight training sessions if this is the right thing for them, if they feel comfortable here, if they like you or your coaches. Um, and we want to make sure we double down in that experience to make sure in that critical period that we convert them into a longer term client, that they get through that 30 day window and they say, hey, I want to continue to keep coming. Um, because I think usually if we can get clients, at least I see in our gym over that hump, over that 30 day hump, they become long term customers for a year longer. Um, but if we don't, if we don't do a good job in that period, typically that's when we lose them. And so, you know, for us, that means little things like, Hey, within that first month, sending, uh, an email, um, or sending a, a phone call from someone in our office from someone who isn't actually their day-to-day -day coach and saying, Hey, I just want to get some feedback. Are you enjoying your experience here at MBSC? Is there anything we could do better? Are you enjoying your connection with your coach? Um, are there some things you like, some things you don't like? Just taking the time to ask them makes them feel like you care. One thing we always really try to do in that first critical period as well, especially if they're in a group training setting, um, you know, is we always say, hey, we're going to make sure we have an extra floater or an intern to make sure, you know, that person gets a little bit of extra attention and us in our group text or an email, you know, saying, hey, make sure we check in on so-and-so, you know, they just started. And we want to make sure that we, especially in that first 30-day period, that they get comfortable. And I think there's a quote that uh, Joey Coleman says, in the book um, about kind of that critical period, that activate and acclimate period in um, and never lose a customer again that I think applies to gyms more than anything else. And the quote is this, for every client, this is most likely their first time they've experienced this particular way of doing things. They're at best unsure or at worst frustrated by their lack of familiarity. If you don't onboard the customer and get them bought into your approach, 
they will never become a long-standing loyal customer. And that is so true in gyms. If you guys listening to this run, um, you know, a personal training gym or a group training gym, and you can, you know, you have a bunch of returning clients. I could think like I have eight people in my group and that ninth person that comes in there, it's their first month. All my clients are kind of running through. They know the names of the exercises. They know where the weights are. They kind of know how we pair our exercises, what a tri set is. They understand all the lingo. Meanwhile, that new person is staring up at the board with the template on it. They don't know the names of the exercises. They don't know the, the sets and reps. They don't know where the weights are. They feel completely lost at sea in that moment. And what I always tell our coaches is like, we want to watch out for that person in that critical period to make sure we answer their questions and we provide them support before they even have to ask the question. Because if for too many times, if they feel like I don't know what's happening and I don't see anybody here to help me, they're going to feel like they're not supported and they're not getting their money's worth. We don't want the customer to feel neglected after the sale is made. That's when they start to feel resentment and buyer's remorse. And they say, yeah, maybe this just doesn't work for me. And they might not tell you that they didn't like the experience. Typically, if someone has a negative experience within your business, they're not going to necessarily tell you that negative experience. They're just going to tell you it doesn't work out. Hey, it's too much money. When they say it's too much money, they mean it's not. they're not getting the value for what they pay. They don't necessarily mean it's too much money. Um, and so what you want to make sure you do is continue to provide support and take away any uncertainty, especially in that critical period until that client really gets up and running and feels comfortable in your business. And then maybe you can take the foot off the gas a little bit. So, so they can start to develop some autonomy and they don't, you don't feel, they don't feel like you're hovering over them at every moment, but especially in that critical period, we want to make sure, Hey, we're setting up their station for them. We're giving them extra demos. We're giving them a little bit of extra feedback. Even little things, hey, this is how you read your sheet correctly, okay? When we go to set, get on the bike, hey, this is how we set up the seat correctly to make sure the seat height. Think about all the little things that new clients screw up. And so that quote is especially true in training. And we want to make sure we double down and go really hard, especially in that critical period, to make sure that they are acclimating and they're not frustrated. They are going to feel unsure. Everyone, especially in a training environment, it's intimidating. It's scary when it's new. Um, but we want to make sure we double down on that to make sure that they feel comfortable. Um, and so those are two of the bigger points I kind of want to touch in the podcast today. I mean, I have a million points. There's eight phases of the customer ex experience. Um, I'm going to put the whole presentation. I'll start putting up some clips. It is available on uh, CFSC. You can watch the entire presentation, but I'll start putting some clips out. I um, mean, I'll get the whole thing up on MBSC TV at some point. But those two were two things that I always really try to harp on. One, that I think customer service is so important if we actually want to make a dent in the healthcare and fitness problem in America. Um, I think gym culture, most people are intimidated with gyms or they have negative experiences with gyms or they don't identify with going to the gym. And I think a big part of that is our customer service experience. People don't feel comfortable there. Um, and we don't do a great job making outsiders feel comfortable there. And so I like to look in the gym and see people of all different shapes and sizes and backgrounds that can come there and all feel comfortable in our facility. I think that we do a really good job of that at MBSC. Um, and, and that, you know, you know, doubling down on providing that great customer service experience is really kind of what sets apart, I think, um, really great successful businesses from average ones or ones that don't survive. I think COVID highlighted a lot of that. I think businesses that had done a really good job with customer service prior, um, probably got through maybe by the skin of their teeth um, COVID because they probably had a lot of undying support from people um, who were patrons of their business. I know we did. I, without our clients, many of them continued to pay when we were closed for online coaching because they cared about this business, um, I think because of the customer service that we provided. And so, um, you know, I, I highly recommend, again, if you haven't read Never Lose a Customer Again, go pick that up. Um, again, I'll put out my entire presentation for you guys to watch. Um, and if you have questions about customer service, I will answer them on the next podcast. So Coach Kevin Carr at gmail.com, please send in any questions that you have. And I would be happy to have any more content. Like I said, I have some good interviews coming up. I'm Brendan will be back. But whatever you guys send in, I love the mailbag. Um, and that actually brings me to my question of the day today. Um, and we have a great one. So um, as you know, we have strengthcoach.com. It is a forum where you can ask questions to um, myself, Brandon Rarick, Mike Boyle. We have some amazing coaches in all professional sports. I think we have you know strength coaches in every professional organization 
or uh, professional sport on strength coach answering questions every single week. Um, but I got a great one from Bilal Youssef, who is a great member on the forum. He asked a lot of questions. Um, and he said, I know the benefits of functional strength exercises as compared to machine weights, but coaches, let me know why coaches, please let me know why the following exercise might be a bad choice from a scientific angle. And he lists a bunch of exercises, things like leg press, things like hack squat, things like pec flies, traditional machine circuit exercises. Um, and, and, you know, just ask about, you know, Hey, why would you choose functional, functional free weights, things like that over traditional, uh, machine-based exercises. And I think Brendan did a good job responding. I responded. Mike had some nice humorous <laughs> responses regarding uh, machine-based exercises. Um, so if you guys are on Strength Coach, go check out that thread. But I kind of wanted to touch on the idea of free weights versus machines. Very controversial. Um, if you're you know, a typical machine guy or bodybuilding type, um, don't shut off the episode yet. I'm not going to completely shit on the idea of using machines, but I think that there's a time and place for both kind of methods, but I want to shine, you know, shine a light on why I think, you know, using free weights is a better idea for the majority of people training. Um, I think it's important to kind of think of, um, strength training exercise. Think about all kind of the parts of the universe when it comes to strength training, right? Bodybuilding, powerlifting, strongman, Olympic lifting, we're strongly influenced in strength training by traditional strength sports, things like powerlifting, bodybuilding, Olympic lifting, etc. And so many of the exercise selections, when you go into most gyms, when you look in magazines, when you see how gyms are designed, just the machine selection, are going to be influenced by traditional strength sports. The problem with that is for the average population, the average person in gym goer who wants to exercise or the athlete who wants to exercise is the goal of many of the things in traditional strength sports is very different than what the average trainee or the competitive athlete probably needs or wants. In bodybuilding, the goal is to add as much hypertrophy as possible, to add as much muscle onto your frame as you possibly can. The goal is not to be fast. The goal is not to be it's even to be as strong as possible or to move dynamically or to just even be more functional in your daily life. Watch a high level uh, bodybuilder try to, you know, reach for something out of the back of their car or watch a high level bodybuilder try to play a sport. And you'll realize how they have less variability or movement options and how they move every day. But that's not their goal, right? Their goal is to be as muscular as possible. Machines provide a great avenue for adding as much, much, much muscle to your body as humanly possible. And if that is your goal, machines are probably a really good option. That is because machines limit the amount of variability in a movement, right? If I am on a leg press machine and I'm laying down with my feet up in the air and you, I mean, you, it can, you can see it plainly. The guy has like a guy or girl might have like 10 or 10 plates on each side. They can't squat with 10 plates on each side, but that's because they don't have to stabilize their abdominals on a leg press. They don't have to load their spine on a leg press. They don't have to have any multi-planar stabilization on a leg press. They just have to crank their legs in and their hips and knees in and out of flexion extension and move that load. It completely takes away any variability or multi-planar demand which allows them to drive as much metabolic stress into those tissues, get as much stretch and as much load through those tissues as possible to add muscle. So it becomes a really good tool to do that, right? Um, similarly, right, um, if I'm on, you know, I'm doing a half kneeling overhead press with a kettlebell or a dumbbell, what do I have to do, right? I have to stabilize my pelvis. I have to stabilize my trunk. I have to stabilize that weight because it's not on a machine and I have to use my rotator cuff to centrate that joint as I press the weight overhead. Whereas if I use, you know, a seated bilateral overhead press mount, uh, overhead press machine, I don't have to stabilize anything else, right? I really can just push my back into that pad, push my feet in the floor and drive that weight up overhead, right? A great avenue to put on as much muscle as possible, but you leave the movement variability aspects that translate more to everyday life out of the process, right? And so again, 
think about the goal of the training process. I think the average gym goer, if you ask, if I ask the average person who comes to the NBSC, I say, hey, what's your goal of coming here? Why do you want to exercise? I would guess that almost 0% would say, hey, I want to put on as much muscle as I possibly can. I want to be as jacked as humanly possible. I would guess the most and say, hey, I want to feel better when I, you know, move through my daily life, when I, you know, work in the yard, um, when I'm working a long shift. I don't want to have back pain. I don't want to have shoulder pain. I just want to feel better. Or maybe I want to lose a little bit of weight and put on a little bit of muscle. Or some of my athletes would say, hey, I want to perform a little bit better on the field. I want to get injured less. Machines aren't the best avenue to get that outcome, right? Again, like I said, actually in the thread, machines are better than not exercising at all. Undoubtedly, undoubtedly. If you were to tell me, hey, all I can do is machines, go for it. Knock yourself out. Do as much as you want. Um, I would say you probably could do things other than machines because you have your body weight and you could probably find a dumbbell or a kettlebell somewhere, but that's beside the point. Um, the majority of people have more variable outcomes that they want to train for and they have more variable patterns that they want to move through. So generally free weights are going to be a better option because they demand multiplanar stability, demand you to be on your feet and to use your balance and to stabilize. They translate better to more variable environments like everyday life and sporting environments. And so and that's what we want to think of. And the same goes for traditional powerlifting exercises, right? The goal in powerlifting is to get to lift as much weight as possible in a back squat, straight bar deadlift, and a barbell bench press. So if you're going to compete in powerlifting, you should probably use the powerlifting exercises to get good at those things. I was, if you said, hey, I want to be a great powerlifter, but I don't want to back squat, straight bar deadlift, or barbell bench press, I would say you're, you're not going to be a good powerlifter because you need to have specificity in the way that you train. But if you said, hey, I want to be the best athlete possible, or hey, I just want to feel better um, when I play with my kids or go work in the yard or go for a run on the weekend, I might not say you have to do any of those exercises, right? And so I think it's important to remember that exercises are tools um, to get specific outcomes. And I think, you know, there's, we always have the debate of like good exercise, bad exercise. I think there probably are some bad exercises, or like I said in a thread uh, on Twitter recently, that, you know, what makes a bad exercise? You know, people always say there are no bad exercises, but what makes a bad exercise is something that the average person, if we're talking in the context of how most of us work as trainers, is a bad exercise, something that somebody can't, the average person probably cannot do well, right? They might not have the degrees of freedom. The average person probably doesn't have the degrees of freedom to do a behind the neck press really well. Um, the average person probably doesn't have the uh, degrees of freedom to do a heavy Jefferson curl really well. That's not to say there aren't people that can't do those things. And the examples that people always use um, in Twitter debates is like the extreme of somebody, um, you know, Jefferson curling like 400 pounds or something like that, or behind the neck pressing 225. But the average person who goes to the gym who really needs our help in fitness, you know, the the 50 year old accountant guy who has back pain, or the mother of two who just wants to get back to exercising and feel good again after having her kids, those aren't the people who generally need to do exercise like that, they need to lift free weights, they need to move variably, they need to jump, they throw, skip, they need to rotate, they need to throw med balls, they need to push, pull legs and core on a daily basis, and they probably need to do some consistent cardiovascular work, either running or on a bike, um, or pushing a sled. And so um, I think in all of fitness debates is going to get into a bigger topic. Um, context is really important. And I think the, the loudest people on either side of the debate are usually at the extremes. They're usually the, the pure rehab functional people on one side. And they're like the power lifting, um, Olympic lifting, uh, bodybuilding types on the other side. And the reality is the average client is definitely in the middle. They're not on either of those extremes. They want to feel better. They want to move better. They want to look a little bit better. And so that means your choices are going to be much more general and they're going to be uh, much less extreme um, in your exercise selection. And so I think often people in fitness want to um, use the extremes as examples for everything that they do. But the reality is uh, the money is made and our biggest impact is made in working with people who are on the average, whether it's athletes um, or um, just everyday people. Um, I think I heard somebody use this example before too, is that like the majority of people that we're going to work with in fitness are like a Toyota Camry. They're not going to go that fast, but they're going to go for a lot of mileage and we don't want to break it. We want to make it run a little bit better. We want to provide regular maintenance. We want to soup it up just enough that they can get everything they need out of it, but they're never going to race that thing. 
Um, and, and so when you accept that most of us are calling me working with a Toyota Camry um, for a client most of the time, then you can better make exercise selections and really do the best you can working with that individual. So that was my rant based on, you know, you know, Bilal's question on the forum, as well as kind of the overall picture as far as exercise selection goes. Um, I know we're coming up on about an hour here, so I just want to give my book recommendation when we wrap it up for the day here. Uh, my book recommendation is, if, you have the, if you're watching on video here, is Unreasonable Hospitality uh, by Will Guadera. I think that's how you pronounce his name. I saw a couple of people recommend this book earlier this year. I hadn't read it. And then Mike Boyle actually bought it for us. It has been unbelievable. I know if some of you, if you watch the show, The Bear, it is featured on season two of The Bear. Um, Richie, the best character arc that has happened in all, pretty much any show, but definitely on The Bear. Richie, uh, it has this book in his hand as he kind of makes his positive character arc in season two. Outstanding. Um, Will Guerrero is a restaurant owner. Um, if you've read Setting the Table by Danny Meyer, he worked with Danny Meyer for a long time. So an unbelievable book. Um, uh, no matter what type of business, all this is a restaurant, he owns restaurants. Um, this, the ideas and this could be applied to anything. So unbelievable. I flew through this really quickly. I've actually, I'm going back through and highlighting, um, and writing notes. So unreasonable hospitality, the remarkable power of giving people more than they expect. Um, and it's one of those books that you read and you always think, okay, I can do a better job. And there's some things I need to change. And those are the most valuable books, um, that I think you can read. So I can't recommend that one enough. Um, so yeah, that's my recommendation. We're back. Um, like I said, I'm going to be pumping these out every single week. Now I swear to you, I promise you we'll be back again next week. Um, and we're going to keep them coming. We're going to have a lot of great interviews. We will get Brendan back here at some point soon. Um, guys, if you want to catch me out there, we have a lot of CFSC events coming up very, very soon. Um, we just had one in Boston, Massachusetts. If you missed that, I'm sorry. Uh, but we do have some coming up later this month. We are going to be in Reading, Pennsylvania. Reading, Pennsylvania for a CFSC Level 1, Level 2 combo event. August 26th and 27th at Alliance Fitness Center. Again, August 26th and 27th, we have a combo deal. If you buy both, if you're going to attend both Level 1 and Level 2, we have a promo code. Go to um, our Instagram, at Certified FSC. It's on there. You guys can sign up, get a discount by taking both events both certifications in one weekend. That's August 26th, 27th. Then September 17th, 16th and 17th, we have another combo weekend. We're going to be at MBSC in Woburn, Massachusetts at the Mothership. That's always one of our biggest events. Usually we have you know 50 people there. We have about eight coaches who are going to help coach you guys. It's a great experience. We're probably also going to get a Mike Boyle experience. Usually he comes in, does Q&A, does a little bit of education as well. You don't really get that unless you come to MBSC. So that's September 16th and 17th, level one and level two at MBSC in Woburn, Massachusetts. We're going to be in Miami, Florida for a level one on September 16th. Miami, Florida at Movement Lab as well. September 17th, we're also going to be in Golden, Colorado. That is going to be a big and busy weekend for us at CFSC. We're also going to be in Golden, Colorado for a level one September 17th. September 24th at Montvale, New Jersey at Lifetime. We have a partnership with Lifetime Health Clubs. If you are a Lifetime coach listening to this or you just want to go visit a Lifetime at their beautiful health clubs, we will be there on September 24th in Montvale, New Jersey. That will be a great experience um, because, uh, again, Lifetime is really nice. It's super nice there. And, um, you know, I know they're looking for coaches too. That's part of the reason why we want to go there. We will be in Level 1 in October 7th um, uh, in, at Motion on in New York City, October 7th for a Level 1 event. October 1st, we're going to be uh, in Fairport, New York. So that's kind of up near Rochester at our friend. Um, our friend Nate Van Kohenberg's place, Next Level Strength Condition. We're going to do a combo event there as well. So October 14th and 15th, we're going to have Level 1, Level 2 up near Rochester. October 14th, we are going to be at a Level 1 in San Diego, California. Um, we have a bunch more coming down the pipe. So um, head to cfsc.inspire360.com. You can see all of the events we have coming up. We're going to be all around the United States as well as internationally. If there's anywhere you want us to come to, let us know. Uh, we also have an online certification course, so you can get us there. So I appreciate you guys all listening. First episode back. Look forward to doing more. If there are any questions or topics you want us to cover, please let us know. I appreciate you guys tuning in. Have a great night, and thank you for listening.